All right, welcome everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties there. We were trying to get the live stream going. Um, so now we will start the event. Um, I'd like to say welcome everyone. And uh, you're currently tuned in to Bioacoustics in Indonesia and Malaysia Conservation in Action webinar. We have an amazing lineup today. If you are keen to learn about passive acoustic monitoring, how sound libraries are formed, and the diverse sounds of amphibians, elephants, gibbons, then you're in the right place. Our speakers today are from Indonesia, Malaysia, and the United States. A quick heads up, unfortunately, one of our speakers, Dr. Nuro Iza, is unable to, unable to join us today. So Ethan Pang will fill in uh, for her. This webinar is organized by K. Lisa Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. School of Biological Sciences, USM, and Faculty of Forestry, Universitas Gajah Mada. This event is kindly hosted by the Habitat Foundation. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Yen Yi. Um, I'm from Malaysia. Um, I did my PhD in avian uh, bioacoustics in New Zealand, and I'm interested in vocal learning, animal behavior, and conserving our natural soundscapes. I will be a moderator today and I'm very excited to be here in this webinar. Before we begin, here's what we have in store for you today. Today's webinar is in conjunction with a very special announcement um, of an effort to help build the capacity of bioacoustics research in Indonesia and Malaysia, which is the Bioacoustics Mentorship and Equipment Award for Indonesians and Malaysians. To put this into context, we will first start with a series of bioacoustics talks that will last for uh, 10 minutes each, and we will then move to a 20 minute Q&A where the speakers will answer any questions from the audience. At the end of the Q&A, Dr. Wendy Erb will announce this new uh, equipment and mentoring award program. Some quick housekeeping before we start. I see that most of you have found the chat function. If you haven't, please click the speech bubble icon on the bottom if you're on Zoom. If you have any questions for the speakers that we would like to ask, please type them in the chat and we will get to them uh, during the Q&A session. If you're on Facebook, right, uh, Facebook Live, rest assured that your questions will also be answered uh, during the Q&A. Um, just pop them in the comment section. Please mute your microphone during the uh, talk to minimize disruption to the speakers. Um, if you have limited internet bandwidth, please feel free to turn off your camera during the talks. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dina Klink from Cornell Lab of Ornithology, who will give us an idea of what is passive acoustic monitoring. Dina's principal scientific interest lies in behavioral ecology, evolution of acoustic signals, and her research focuses on the evolution and maintenance of vocal diversity in Bornean gibbons using in innovative bioacoustic techniques with an emphasis on testing new technology and drawing, dra drawing from diverse fields, such as human speech recognition, uh, machine learning, and signal processing. Let's put our virtual hands together to in uh, <clears throat> welcome Dr. Dina. All right, hello, and thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Let me get my screen share going here. Oops, portion of the screen. Okay, can everybody see that okay? See my screen? Okay, all right, well, as I said, thank you so much for being here. Um, this is really exciting. And uh, I just have a really short talk that um, I want to give you. And so today we'll be hearing from some amazing people who are using bioacoustic methods in their own research uh, based in Malaysia and Indonesia. And the goal of my talk is to provide some context for you and a little bit of background so that you can better enjoy the rest of the presentations. 
And so I'm hoping to provide kind of a high level overview of what's possible using acoustic methods and also give you an idea of some of the relative challenges of different types of applications. Um, because this is a really short talk, it's not possible to cover all of the topics and be really comprehensive. So there will be lots of simplification um, and some omission of detail. And importantly, any applications that you're interested in doing really need to be considered on a case by case basis. But the talk will be organized. So first, we'll talk about bioacoustics um, and the different domains within bioacoustics. And then we'll talk about passive acoustic monitoring. And I will define these terms in the next slides um, and think about the types of applications that you can do using PAM. And then lastly, data analysis approaches. And so bioacoustics, we can think of bioacoustics as being broadly the study of animal sounds. And it comprises three distinct domains or areas. And so these areas overlap, but the questions they address and the methods they use are largely distinct. And so here are the three different domains. So we'll talk through each of them in turn. So the first is the level of the individual. And so for this, we generally ask behavioral ecology or evolution type questions. So we can ask, what is the function of the call? What do they mean? Uh, or are the calls individually distinct? And in this case, we tend to analyze individual calls. We often use something called feature extraction from the spectrogram, where we can draw boxes and estimate duration of the note or note frequency. These types of recordings are generally made with a handheld battery operated recorder, directional microphone that is attached to a person. And so we tend to have uh, about recordings on the, the seconds the seconds or hours. Um, and then we have the next one going up to population level. And so the types of questions that we can address here include presence or absence of vocal animals, also density estimation. Um, in this case, we're not necessarily interested in individual calls, but we're interested in looking over longer time periods about when, we, when animals or individuals are calling. And so we often use uh, autonomous recorders. Um, and so in this case, they can record for a short time or they can record for thousands of hours. And then the next domain is that of the ecosystem. And so the kinds of questions we can ask here are, are there differences across habitats or how does human disturbance such as logging or fire influence the ecosystem? And so in this case, our target is not just the calls of a single focal species, it's the entire soundscape, which is basically all of the things that we can record. And again, these are recorded using autonomous recording devices. And so the, the duration of the recordings can be continuous for many, many days, months, or years. And so now we'll shift just a little bit into PAM or passive acoustic monitoring. And so what do I mean when I say PAM? It is the use of unattended or autonomous acoustic recording devices that are used to monitor wildlife populations and or ecological communities. And so we can think of this as kind of a collection of approaches and methods that rely on these, the use of these autonomous recording devices. And so why, why would we want to use PAM? So in many habitats, uh, tropical forest environments, for example, we can detect animals much further by the sounds that they make than by any other means, um, such as the, the movement or using our vision. And so that's a really great reason to, to want to study their sounds. Um, Another one, sounds are detectable in the dark. Uh, so humans and human observers, we tend to be pretty reliant on our eyes and vision, um, but we can't see anything in the dark, uh, but sounds are detectable in the dark. And then, um, so if we think about a lot of traditional ecological monitoring methods, so avian point counts or frog surveys, these have generally relied on acoustic detection of specific taxonomic groups. Um, but what we're doing now with PAM is we are replacing the human observer with a autonomous acoustic recording unit. And so there are some benefits to this. So first, we can think about relative to using a human observer, um, PAM data 
allows us to have a permanent objective archive of the raw data. And there are some really great benefits to this. So if you record your data, you analyze it, and then a few years later, a new method comes out, you have all of the acoustic data there, assuming that you archived it well, which that's a whole nother question, um, that you can then reanalyze with new methods. Um, another really great thing is that maybe you were planning on doing a study on one animal or one, one system, and then maybe there's something else that you're interested in, and PAM data can actually allow you to address unplanned questions. Um, I can speak to that from experience. I am predominantly a gibbon researcher. I went out my first PAM study. I was planning on focusing just on gibbons. And since then, we were able to get um, data and papers out on great Argus pheasants and hornbills. So you never know what you might do with those data. <laughs> Um, another great thing, so relative to having a human observer in the field, you won't have really any behavioral impact. So once you go and you leave the recorder, then the animals are presumably going to be acting in a normal way. Um, recorders can be deployed in many different remote sites in advance of data collection. And so as opposed to needing to have 10 human observers going out, you can just use a couple observers, go and set your recorders out and collect data continuously. And then PAM can uh, improve survey cost effectiveness. Uh, and then sometimes we get improved detection of target species relative to a human observer. Um, there, is some, there are some caveats to that. Uh, cost effectiveness, yes, it's quite easy to go and set the recorders out, but it does require a lot of manpower to do any sort of data analysis and get meaningful information out. Um, so just thinking about that. And then also sometimes with our detectors, we have it, they perform better than humans, but sometimes not. Um, so that's an area of active research. And so recording options, um, as I've already mentioned, we have lots of different possibilities and it's now quite easy and relatively inexpensive compared to what it used to be to collect thousands of hours of digital audio recordings over a long time period. There are many types of different recording systems available. Um, I do not have time to go through all of the different ones now, but the price range goes from anywhere from about 100 US dollars to over 1,000. Um, and this, this is mostly for the terrestrial ones. And then weight range, they have some really small ones and then also some, some bigger ones. And then there are different recording units that are optimized for aud audible sounds. So within the human hearing range, um, high frequency sounds such as bats, or sounds that are produced underwater. Um, and then we have here a picture down in the bottom left. This is our SWIFT recording unit that was developed in-house in our lab. Uh, and so I just wanna finish this up by, by saying that you need to make sure that you think of your study design and that you kind of make sure that your recorders can do what you need to do. So you need to make sure that the recording device you're interested in buying can actually record in the ultrasound if you want to study bats, for example. So what can we do? There's a lot of different things that we can do and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll go through just a couple. And so I'll rank them from kind of easier to harder. And so the first relatively easy one is detecting, detecting species presence. So if your animals are vocal and they're in a frequency range that you can record, there's a pretty good chance you'll actually be able to detect them. So that's relatively straightforward. Um, quantifying seasonal patterns of activity. So if you're recording over multiple seasons, multiple years, you'll be able to look at changes in uh, vocal activity. Density estimation, so how many animals there are per area. Uh, it's something that we're working on that a lot of people are really interested in. It's quite challenging in terrestrial tropical environments, um, but there, there are people that are working on that. And then comprehensive biodiversity assessment. This is something that people are really, really excited about. And there's lots of different approaches that people are trying, um, but it is quite hard and there aren't any out of the box solutions that are ready to go. And then lastly, we'll talk just a little bit about data analysis approaches. And so a lot of times, this is the bottleneck. We can collect the data quite easily, but then we have to analyze it. And so I'll rank them from kind of the slower to the faster. And so the slowest is human listening. If you imagine you're recording 10 recorders, 24 hours a day, multiple years, you could spend your whole lifetime listening. 
Um, the next one, visual scanning of spectrograms. This is one that I do a lot in my research. Uh, spectrograms are visual representations of the sound, and I'll show you one in the next slide. You can be quite quick with those. Um, it's like reading music, uh, and so it's something that we tend to do quite often. Um, Raven, our acoustic analysis software that we developed in-house, it has quite a few of what we call these specialized detection algorithms. So you can run it over your data, but you do need a lot of human review. Um, it can process quite a bit faster than humans on, with the spectrograms. There tend to be quite a few errors, so you need humans to quantify uh, the accuracy. Lastly, the approach that everybody wants and only a few of us has, um, fully automated machine learning approaches. This is a very new field, new technology. Um, and so we are working towards being able to do that, um, but I wouldn't plan on being able to use something like that right out of the box on your data. And then lastly, um, I just wanna show, cause we're, the next few talks we're going to be seeing spectrograms. So I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about spectrograms. And so here, this is a spectrogram or a visual representation of the sound of a gibbon recorded in Sabah, Malaysia, a gibbon female. On the x-axis, we have time, y-axis, we have frequency, and then the color represents the loudness or amplitude at a specific time and frequency. And so hopefully I'll go ahead and play this for you here. And so now you all know what a spectrogram is. And with that, I will go ahead and finish up and thank you all so much for being here. And I'm really excited to see the rest of the talks. Thank you, Dina. Thank you so much, Dina. That was really, really interesting. <clears throat> um, the really cool part is how you showed the um, slower to faster and easier to um, harder because we people who just started <clears throat> bioacoustics might not necessarily know where to start. So that, that's really, really good that you showed that overview there. Um, thank you. So I'm going to move on to the next speaker today, which is uh, Mei from University Science Malaysia. Mei is a uh, MSc student at but School of Biological Sciences, University Science Malaysia, as the world constantly evolves. She believes that Acoustic studies are vital and advantageous in future conservation efforts, and she's eager to venture into this new field to strengthen Malaysian biodiversity protection. So she's going to talk to us about uh, sound libraries in Malaysia. Over to you, Mei. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Um, sorry. My name is Mei, Yi, and then today I will talk about my planned study, which is the Penang Hill Bioacoustic Study towards the Nature Sound Library for Malaysia. So before I start talking about my study, I would like to give a brief introduction on what is the sound library, its purpose, importance, and also some examples. So a sound library is basically uh, uh, a place where we store collections of sounds and also it is used to support research and acts as a reference. So sounds are important in general uh, as they convey important information. Uh, it's a form of communication and also tells us about wildlife behaviors. Other than that, the sound library also can be used for a public or researchers to explore a species in a region and also visualize acoustic recordings like what we saw just now uh, the, in a spectrogram. So some uh, examples of sound libraries available right now, they are mostly uh, is Macaulay Library by Cornell University, British Library of Wildlife Sounds and uh, others. So other than uh, making a sound library, bioacoustics can also be applied in other applications of uh, conservation. So for this uh, first example, uh, bioacoustics was used to find the preferred habitat of grasshoppers and bush crickets in grasslands. So uh, by doing that, they can, the researchers can focus on these preferred habitats to uh, conserve the grasshoppers and bush crickets. Other than that, 
um, bioacoustics are also used to identify calls and distributions of frogs and toads, where uh, this research by Vihaya Tilaka, uh, they play back, the, they broadcast the calls to attract breeders and also connect fragmented populations as well. And bioacoustics are also used to detect abundance and distribution of uh, yellow belly glider and also they are able to monitor species efficiently with generally less cost and effort required. So about my study, it will be at Penang Hill, which is located at Penang Island, Malaysia. And uh, Penang Hill is a unique hill because there are multiple habitat types and also land use on it. For example, there are private residents, uh, forest reserves, and also uh, farms and orchards on the hill. Well, in 2017, there was this uh, expedition called the Penang Hill Bioblitz. It was uh, carried out by a lot of researchers, and they have proved to the public that Penang Hill is rich in biodiversity. So uh, other than that, just last year, um, Penang Hill was designated as the biosphere reserve by UNESCO under the UNESCO's Men and Biosphere Program. And this uh, aims to improve the livelihood and also protect the ecosystem of the hill at the same time. However, as uh, other uh, ecosystems and other places are facing threats, Penang Hill also faces threats from environmental changes and development in general. So this is a map of the Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve. You can see it covers about a quarter of the island. And for my research, it will be done nearby the, the habitat Penang Hill. So here are some objectives and purpose of my study, which is uh, to assess the biodiversity of Penang Hill, to establish a sound library of wildlife found there, and also to investigate the relation of acoustic indices or the biodiversity with their environmental factors. So overall, uh, this study aims to provide a comprehensive survey using bioacoustics for future studies and also in hopes that it will be used for uh, decision making in conservation management. So after the objectives, I will talk about how will I uh, do my research. So we will carry out the survey design and also pilot study, but overall we will be using F Active and acoustic active and passive acoustic monitoring methods. So why do we choose acoustic monitoring? Uh, I'm sure Dina has already uh, explained, but it's just a short uh, some advantages I would like to talk about, which is the higher detectability rate. It is non-invasive, and we are able to detect diverse organisms that produce sound, from the smallest insects to the largest mammals or birds. So these advantages will help increase the chances of species being detected, described, and also uh, we can protect them as well uh, in the future. So for my data collection, uh, for passive acoustic monitoring, which is PAM here, uh, I'll be setting up uh, five song meter mini recorders and also one uh, ultrasound recorders where uh, it will be set up in the field and left out for two weeks every month. So right now our study site, our planned study site will be in the Bukit Kerajaan Forest Reserve, which is a lower mountain tropical forest and also some orchards found on Binang Hill. So there, we will look at two different types of habitats there. And for active acoustic monitoring, we will be going out on the field to survey and listen and collect data on the wildlife found there using bioacoustics for five days and nights per month. And this, we will be using omnidirectional microphones and also ultrasound recorders and mics. So for this two data collection method, we will be uh, collecting environmental data such as canopy cover, temperature, humidity, and also uh, elevation and some habitat characteristics. So after we collect data, we will analyze them 
and using sound analysis software such as Kaleidoscope or also Raven and also refer to uh, uh, after we get the recording, we will refer to available online sound library and also consult experts to identify the species of the sound uh, recorded. So to assess biodiversity, uh, there are many methods such as the soundscape variation, checking the acoustic energy, and automated detection and also acoustic indices. And other than that, we will look at the acoustic data from different points of the recording as well. So uh, overall, in, because uh, this research I haven't uh, finished, uh, I haven't started yet. <laughs> so the expected outcomes from this research would be a systematic library of sonograms. And with uh, the known residents of wildlife found there, and also we hope to detect rare and un undetected, uh, to record rare and undetected wildlife. So overall, there are quite some process to make a sound library. But after identifying the species that makes the sound, the sound recorded, we will extract the sounds to, and keep them in a folder. And it will, it will be used in the database created to, that will be accessible to public. And we hope that we will update the web page regularly so that uh, it will, uh, it will, we will improve the audio quality to, and upload some photos and videos available of the species. So overall, I hope my research uh, would be uh, useful and also would bring out more opportunities for collaboration and also partnership with many organizations. And then uh, I hope this research will be a good reference and baseline for future biodiversity monitoring using bioacoustics, especially in Malaysia. And there are also other future research possibilities such as acoustics adaptation to environmental changes, and there are breeding and migratory seasons as well. And I hope and I believe this uh, research is interesting and will be useful for public nature education events as well. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Mei. That was really interesting talk. I'm very excited to see this database when it's set up and I hope all of us can uh, use it in the future. Thank you. Uh, share. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, so our next speaker is Hastin Ambar Asti, also from, uh, so she's from uh, Universitas Gajah Mada in Indonesia. She's supported by um, Borneo Nature Foundation. Hastin and her teammate, uh, Chayandra, will conduct, uh, has conducted uh, bioacoustics monitoring of habitual fauna using passive acoustic monitoring and visual encounter surveys. Um, in previous burn areas of Sabangau National Park. Um, and she will talk to us about her project today. Over to you, Hastin. Um, Hastin, are you on mute? Maybe you can unmute yourself uh, because we can't hear you yet. Yeah, hello, good morning. Yes, can hear you now. Um, can you yeah. share your screen again? Okay, can you hear me clearly? Yes, okay. loud and clear. Okay.
Jenny. We can see your presentation. You, you can start now, Hustin. Okay, thank Sorry, I think something wrong here. That's okay. Uh, are you able to share the sound of your video as well? Um, now we are seeing the presenter view of your slides. Earlier it was okay. Um, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, I'm collecting them from the chat, uh, the Zoom chat. And Nadine, uh, one of our tech team as well, is collecting from the Facebook chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in there and it will be answered during the Q&A session. Yep, it looks good now. Um, it is the correct view. Okay, yep. good morning. I'm really sorry. I have a problem with the video. Sorry, so I will start. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. My name is Hastin and along with my team, Chandra, we carried out Herpetofauna Acoustic Monitoring in Sebangau, Central Kalimantan. We thank Borneo Nature Foundation and then Educa Educational Fund Management Institution, Ministry of Finance Indonesia. Natural Laboratory of Pits One Forest Simtrop University of Palangkaraya and Sebangau National Park for making this research possible. So a group of amphibians and reptiles are simply herpetofauna, mostly make sounds. And Ron has regular and distinctive calls, generally a clicking or chirping sound. And most lizards are mute, but some make very chirping, clicking, and squeaking sound. Snakes make sounds by hissing, rattling, and rubbing their scales when they feel threatened. Crocodiles make squeaks, grunt, hisses, and growls. Then turtles produce quiet sound at very low frequencies, making them 
difficult to hear. The passive acoustic method or PAM can identify uh, the presence of species through sound not limited to body size. And PAM can detect the presence of cryptic species such as herpetofauna. So you are interested in using PAM for monitoring herpetofauna in Sibangno. I'm sorry, Hastin. I think yeah. the slides are not moving. Uh, Can you share again? We only saw the cover slide of your presentation. Okay. Can you see? Yes. It? Yes, now it's good. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, then I will continue. The passive acoustic, mm -hmm. uh, acoustic method can identify the presence of species through sound, not limited to body size. PAM can detect the presence of cryptic species such as uh, herpetofauna. So we are interested in using PAM for monitoring herpetofauna in Sibangau. Uh, we conducted research at the Natural Laboratory of Pit Swamp Forest, Sebangau, Central Kalimantan, in the area marked in uh, red circle. And this is an overview of our research design. We collected data um, for 18 days, starting August 16 to September 3rd, 2020. The red area is the burn area. And the green area is the forest. Um, we're still not seeing the change in your slides. Maybe you, yeah, instead of using the presenter view, you just uh, go on with the, yeah without clicking the presenter view. Could you click next now? Or is it not moving okay. still? Yes, okay, now it's moving. Okay, so far so good. <laughs> there are six plants left. Uh, three are in the burn area and three in the forest area. Uh, using the PAM method, we installed two acoustic sensor for each transect. Uh, sensor we uh, installed one meter above the ground level and then set recording for 24 hours uh, to three days. And in addition, we carried out monitoring using the DSWAR and conversion framework, or DES. DES was conducted for three days on each transect during the day. Start from eight to uh, start from eight to eleven, and at night start from nineteen to twenty-two. And our herpetofauna monitoring is not is limited to the only sound produced only by animals and people. We use the call libraries from Biology Research Center, SoundCloud Frog Voices of Borneo, and Frogs of Singapore as references to identify calls. Then we use Raven Pro software for sound analysis. Uh, these are conditions in the field when we collect data. The picture above is the state of the forest that burned in 2015, while the picture below shows the state of the forest area. The burn area looks exposed with sparse vegetation. The vegetation is dominated by Comberto uh, Carpus Rotundatus, or uh, local people said it to me. And then the average tree is just about 8 meters tall. Sunlight reaches the forest floor because the tree canopy is not close enough. Then the forest floor is generally water look, overgrown with floor vegetation and with remnants of fallen trees burn. Then uh, forest area have denser vegetation with diverse vegetation. Trees vary in height, reaching over 20 meters. Uh, the canopy of the trees is quite tight, so sunlight can reach the forest floor in only some places. And the forest floor is dry with some puddles, but when there is continuous heavy rain, the forest floor becomes inundated. 
Uh, here are the preliminary results from the first acoustic sensor along with the PES method. Uh, this are spatially detected during monitoring using the PM and the PES method. Sorry. The plus sign indicates the species identified by the PAM method, while the check mark indicates the species found by the PES method. Uh, we identified seven amphibian species and 13 reptile species. Using PAM, there are two species of anura in the burn area, and in the forest, there are five species of anura and one species of gecko. Um, we also detected the presence of Racoporus harrisoni or brown tree frog in the forest. Previously in this bungal species list, it was estimated that there were species from the genus Racoporus, but uh, the species was not known yet. Uh, in addition, we also detected the presence of Smith forest gecko, which we did not encounter directly with the PS method. Using PS, we got at least six amphibian and 12 reptiles. We added two reptile species to this bangun herpetofauna species list. One lizard from the burn area, Tachyderomus exlimiatus, and the uh, one snakes from the forest area is Pareas carinatus. These are, uh, these are a chart of species addition during monitoring. The PAM and PS curve lines are still rising even though it's at the end of the observation. So the number of species detected may increase in monitoring if monitoring continues. Monitoring using the PM method uh, appear to identify fewer species than the PS. It is because the PAM detection is limited to sound producing species. Uh, however, uh, this fills a gap to complement the PES method by identifying the presence of sound producing species that are difficult to find directly. We think the combination of these two methods is good for uh, monitoring herpetofauna. These are how the different sound types of anurans and kiko appear in the spectrogram. Each species produce a different sound, so the spectrogram looks different too. Uh, the first one is called Panaberanta or brown swamp frog, the most common frog found in the burn areas and the burn forest. Other species that are also commonly found include uh, Ozibozibia sumatra uh, in burn area and Polypedetes quality in the forest area. These are other two voices, the sound of the ground tree frog. The Smith Forest people. The 
us to voice, uh, we were not encountered during our monitoring using the PES method. Uh, these are uh, some of references we use when studying acoustic. There are references to the soundscape, map, carpeted fauna, bioacoustic, and acoustic monitoring survey design. And then lastly, if you are interested in bioacoustic research, you can visit the Wattlabs Laboratory, Faculty of Forestry, Universitas Gajah Mada, or directly contact Dr. Imran at the email address on this slide. Thank you, that's all for me. Thank you, Hestin, for that amazing talk. Um, it was really interesting to hear about all the uh, uh, frog sounds because um, I could never really pick them out from my soundscapes. Uh, if you have any questions for Hestin, please pop them in the chat below. I mean, on the side. Sorry about the problem. <laughs> really sorry. No that. worries. No worries. Okay. So our next speaker was planned to be uh, Dr. Nuro Iza Adrina, but she will not be able to join us today. Uh, I'll still introduce her background here. So she has a PhD from University Science Malaysia, and she's also the co-founder and lead researcher of Gibbons of Peninsular Malaysia, UMCA, which is an outreach effort of the Malaysian Primatological Society. Working closely with the indigenous Batik people, she focuses on the distribution and abundance of gibbons in the great, uh, greater Tamanagara landscape of Baha. So if you were keen to hear about gibbons, don't fret because Ethan Pang, who worked closely with Isa, will be talking to us about his gibbon study. A gibbon is, uh, sorry, Ethan is a, a Master's of Science candidate at University Science Malaysia, a senior program executive at the Habitat Foundation, who is also our host today, and the co-founder of Gibbons of Peninsula Malaysia, Unka. Um, and his research focuses on the group density of agile gibbons in relation to habitat disturbance in the Ulumuda forest complex in Kedah, Malaysia. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Thanks, uh, Yanni, for your kind introduction. So yeah, Isa and I are colleagues, and then we are basically employing the same method uh, at a different part of Malaysia. So um, hello, ev everyone. My name is Ethan, and I will be presenting to you my research project that focuses on a Jalkiban population in Ulumuda. So I would like to quickly introduce this group of animal uh, before we move on. So gibbons are also known as the small, the small apes. They belong to the primate family Hylobatidae. And as of 2017, they are currently 20 species of them spreading across Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Southern China. And all of them are either listers uh, listed as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered on IUCN red list. So this is not fun uh, for being a gibbon. So in peninsula, uh, in, in Malaysia, we have five species of small apes, three species in, in the peninsula and two uh, in the Borneo side of Malaysia. So we have a gibbon, which you can see in the green polygon here, and then Siamang in the middle, uh, the central forest spine area, and then large gibbons uh, basically elsewhere. It's interesting to see the agile gibbon is dividing the large gibbon into two subpopulations, which we, we are really keen to find out more about that. But this distribution data is based on the 1970s to 1980s data, and we don't know much about them now, which I'll come to that later. And this is my field site, Ulumuda, right in the part of the Jagibans population distribution. So I say, say it earlier. Hmm. You see the next slide? 
Okay, there you go. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the Malaysian Borneo, we have two other species of small apes, the North Bornean gibbons and also Everest Great gibbons. Right, all Malaysian small ape species are listed as endangered on IUCN red list, and they are now threatened mainly by habitat loss and poaching for illegal pet trade. And we do not know how many of them are still out there in the wild in Malaysia, but the last study were done some 40 to 50 years ago in the 70s to 80s. And there was, there was um, those people who are greater than me, they came before me and uh, they lay down a lot of good and baseline data on behaviors and their uh, distribution. But yeah, we do need to know how many of them right now. And at the same time, Malaysia has gone through a major rapid development uh, progress and many of the given habitats have been inevitably converted for other land use. So we do need to know more about them to help uh, developing an action plan to protect them. From the angle of bioacoustic, why do we study gibbons using this method? So one may ask why uh, studying the gibbons using this methodology. Well, gibbons are very elusive, elusive and often flee from human when they notice us. Okay, we'll be very lucky to see them in the wild. Okay, they will just run away from you. Imagine how difficult would it be to study them by spotting them along a transect, which people have done before. Okay, and an alternative to that will be habituating the gibbons. Okay, but it will be extremely labor intensive, which people have also done before. But anyone can hear them in their habitat. Yes. And they're just not making sound. They are loud. Okay, the song can be heard as far as two kilometers away. And since we know when the, uh, the, when the song comprises of both male and female parts, it means they are a pair bond, a bonded pair and might have children. So it's a family. So a, a typical gibbon family consists of uh, a father and a mother and up to sometimes four children, but usually they have two. And since we also know when they do that, when they sing together, they are defending their home range and they are not moving about. So they are not moving in and out of the area. So we can assume that is a close population. So we can use their song to estimate their group density. And this method is not at all invasive to the animal. So my opinion is that gibbons is really is a model organism for bioacoustic. So you may ask, how do they sound like for the gibbons? So the long ascending and descending call of the song is played by, well, it's sung by the, the female, whereas the shorter notes are sung by the male. This is when uh, you can tell it's actually a, a bonded pair. So again, back to my project site, it's called the Ulumuda Forest Reserve in the northwest part of Peninsular Malaysia. And it's largely a lowland ditrokup forest, which you do not get a lot in Malaysia anymore. And it's a critical water catchment area that um, supports about 4.2 million people in uh, the neighboring states. So Perlis, Kadat itself, and Penang. Right, and uh, it has been recorded uh, 112 mammals, including the Asian elephants, a lot of birds, and 10 hornbill species can be found in uh, in Ulumuda and uh, reptiles and lots of insects. So it's a, it's a very 
invaluable landscape to be protected. Anyway, so in order to better understand how many groups are there in an area, so and I employ the method that is called a fixed point active acoustic triangulation survey, okay, by Tin and Rawson. So at the time of uh, of the field work, this is a more this this method appears to be a more time and economically efficient method. And that I've learned, and I also learned that it gives a similar estimate compared to a more traditional method called the line transect. Okay, so we did nine such expeditions within a course of a year. So since uh, this is uh, unlike the passive acoustic monitoring, the active one requires human presence in the field for collecting acoustic data. That means my field assistant and I myself spend days in the forest, waking up early in the morning, went into the, the forest in the dark to a certain point uh, in the forest and sit there for four hours so that we can listen to the cause of, of the gibbons and record the following. The compass bearing, where are they calling from? Where's the call coming from? Relative to our location, listening post. What time did they call? Or start, start calling and stop calling. And then the estimated distance. And then we triangulate that using the GIS program. So since my manuscript is not publicly uh, accepted yet, it's not public, published yet. So I would like to save you for many uh, technical details. I won't be showing you all my findings in the public for now, but what I can show you that in terms of group density, the agile gibbons are doing just as good in recently logged forests and unlocked forests. And by logging, I mean the, log, the forest has been select, selectively logged, not clear cut or the large or full scale land conversion. Anyway, uh, despite that, it does not mean that, um, hey, let's selectively lock more forests since gibbons wouldn't care if they are not affected. But this is not the case. What I'm really saying is that, hey, even degre degraded forests is a good habitat for gibbons and we should protect them. But why Ulumuda? Okay, I really think Ulumuda deserves to be fully protected because the Urjal Gibbon basically enjoy the, the entire landscape by themselves. Okay, it could be the last stronghold for them, for the animals in on mainland Asia. Although, yes, you although you can find Urjal Gibbon along the Big Dang Range, which is in orange, the orange um, rectangle here. Uh, the landscape is largely mountainous, it's not a lowland and is fragmented and is disturbed from the east and west is sandwiched between development. Whereas in Royal Bloom, which is in the light blue uh, rectangle here, okay, uh, the Urja Gibbon has to share the habitat with a bit of Lar Gibbon in the south and also uh, largely with Siamang, which is shown to be a competitor for uh, other small age species. So I would not expect Royal Bloom would have the same density as in Ulumuda. And so is the, the Bintang range over here. So what's next? Although the fixed point count is, well, it's less demanding compared to the line transect, it is nonetheless a labor intensive and can only be conducted for a discrete period of time. Like what I've done, I've done that in 2018, but if you would like to do the same this year, I will have to go, go into the jungle again, which is kind of very difficult. So I highly anticipate new methods that involve automation, machine learning that can make population monitoring less of an effort and more current. Hence, hence I also look forward to a systematic nationwide census so that we can, we can do that to all um, potential small apes habitats. I also suggest um, we, do, we look into seasonal variability and food availability to be, so to be accounted in future, future studies. We also recommend future study in the forest where altitude gradient uh, is taken account for because we know that uh, a jackie does better 
in lowland forest than the highland forest. Right, just a bit of advertisement. So we are from UNCA, Small Apes of Malaysia Research and Outreach. We are actually one of the many projects uh, run by the Malaysian Primatological Society and NGO. And if you wonder what is UNCA, UNCA is given in the Malay language. So we assess the distribution, abundance and conservation status of small apes in peninsula Malaysia. And we inform management plans and we do and uh, quite a bit of education programs uh, pro, uh, prior to COVID. So we use game to communicate what is uh, given, any threat, and how to plan a field trip to study uh, gibbons. So do support us when you're in Malaysia and you're hiking or you're going to the jungle, report your gibbon encounters uh, on using our Facebook Messenger. So uh, you can send us a re video recording a GPS location, smartphone will work just fine, the time and the date. And do report wildlife crime to the authorities. All right, yeah, they are still being poached for, for pet trade. And if you're interested, you can uh, support us by buying the our field work t-shirts, dry fit, silk screen print, and it's just only 50 ringgit, not including postage. And I would like to thank Dr. Nadine Rupert, who, uh, who is now on Facebook monitoring the chat, and my co-supervisor, Prof. Nick. And special thanks to uh, Dr. Susan Lapan and Fat Barlett from US. And these are my, my funder, including uh, the, my starter. And also thanks, special thanks to Jaimir of uh, Earth Lodge in Ulumuda. Green Smith and my colleagues, uh, Isa, and also other field assistants. If you would like to find out more, you can email us. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. That was an amazing talk from how to listen to gibbons to their conservation. Our last speaker for today is Giot Marganti Ito Simanulang. She is a uh, Bachelor of Specialist Student at the Faculty of Forestry, Universitas Gajah Mada. Along with her teammates, Ida, Anissa, and Nabil, they studied the Sumatran elephant localizations in Gunung Lesur National Park and Wei Kambas National Park with the support of Sumatran Elephant Conservation Initiative. Over to you, Giot. Thank you, Yeni. Yi. I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it and I can hear you. Oh, okay. okay good to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Giyot Simanulang. Let me explain our research and journey about elephant vocalization. First, I will introduce our team that study elephant vocalization. From left is Nabila, Ihda, Anissa, and me. We are very grateful to Sechi and IEP for the funding us so we can get to the field. And we also thank for Waikambas National Park and Gunung Leosa National Park for giving us permission to do our research. First of all, elephants, which are the largest terrestrial mammals, produce sounds when moving, communicating, or sensing their environment. Elephants are highly social animals that living in a group that really heavily on their communicative abilities to maintain their social structure. That's why bioacoustics method is effective used for elephant research. Elephants emit infrasound to communicate with the community or other elephants. Infrasonic sound is a category of sound that cannot be captured by the human sense of hearing because the frequency produced is very low, which is less than 20 hertz. Uh, there have been several studies related to elephant vocalization abroad, but no research about Sumatran elephant vocalization has ever been carried out. One of studies on elephants conducted was by Sermin da Silva, which discusses about acoustic communication in the ASEAN elephant, Elephas maximus maximus. And Sermin's sound data set is our reference in conducting bioacoustic research on Sumatran elephants. 
However, there are many factors that can hinder voice transmission. Sound signals can be weak due to several factors, such as leaves, air turbulence, temperature gradients, surface effects on, and vocalization from other animals that can absorb, reflect, and reflect sound waves. Therefore, we choose to major research topics, namely, one, open vocalization associated with their behavior and detection distance to know ability of the recording device, how far the recorders can detect open sound. Before we went to the field, this is our preparation. Start from weekly meeting with Dr. Imron and Sechi. We have to learn a lot of things and we do the weekly meeting until now actually. After that, we join the recorder installation at Wanagamo Forest in February until August last year with our friends from Atmaja University, Nico. After the devices arrived in our college, we tried to configuration and test it. It's like our first trial. After that, we tried to record in our college for three days to test the result. We also did the weekly study, literature meeting with Dr. Imron. It's like discuss any books uh, and journal to enhance our knowledge about acoustic. With our team every week, it was more interesting because we could discuss and learn a lot of things together. And our final simulation before we went to the field was in Gambira Loka Zoo in four days in June. We tried to install the device in every distance and observe the elephant there. After preparation and simulation, we go to our research site. Uh, we were divided into two teams with different rotations. Ihda and Anissa at the Alapan Response Unit Galioso, Waikamba National Park, while Nabila and Dai at the Conservation Response Unit, Gunung Leosar. We were in the field for three months, September until November 2021. Uh, what did we do in the field? First, we checked the field conditions, recorder placement, then trial and error. We did several simulations to make sure the Alapan's voice would be recorded properly and reduce tall installation error. In fact, we've placed some recorders in one tree to know the difference as picture. Next, data collection. We placed recorder according to the point that we have determined after the field survey. Recorders were also placed in elephant's cage as a sound sources or behavior and we observed 11 observations during the morning to evening with 24 hour recording. Uh, so this is the result. These are some type that we found at Leosa National Park and Waikambas National Park. We divided it uh, general individual and mass male elephant. For the general individual, there are trumpet used when they meet the herd, protest and distress call and playing. The calf makes a trumpet sound when playing. The next one is roar. Roar are produced when they are in afraid or scared, protest and distress call. And for the female elephant, uh, female elephant use this for calling her child from a far distance. We also got rumble that used to describe low frequency acoustic signals. Uh, the ranges of fundamental frequency is between 13 until 35 hertz, and 11 can detect and respond rumble over two kilometers, over two kilometer distances. Rumble used to communicate with other elephants when they feed, also when breastfeeding her calf. They often use rumble. Next is squeak. For the squeak, mass sound and chirp. Uh, just found in Waikambas National Park, not in the Leosar. Squeak was occurred in the context play and interaction with Mahut. Baher, one of calf in Waikambas, often produced this sound in almost everything he did. Next is chirp, produced by Baher also in Waikambas, when in pain or afraid about something. Next, a uh, mass sound. Mason is this is specific sound produced by mass male elephant named Aditya in Waikambas almost every single time. When we hear it, it's like a whistle sound. 
Okay, this is the example of the sound and spectrogram that we found. To get this, we use Raven Pro to analyze data. Raven Pro allows us to know the spectrogram, frequency, and other information about sound that we analyzed. The first sound is trumpet. This is the sound. Next roar. Rumble. Visual frequency sound. Squeak. Mass sound. Like the whistle sound. And chirp. Okay. Uh, the other result in our research is detection distance. But this is the initial result, not the final result, because we still analyze the data. Uh, the first one is Tangkahan Gunung Leus, tang, di tang, in Tangkahan Gunung Leusa National Park. Recorders are placed every 100 meter, meter to one kilometer. Recorder placement are divided into two several sessions because limited recorders that we have. In the forest, there are three sessions with different times. And for non-forest or palm plantations, there are two sessions which are also at different times. From this table, we can see trumpet type has a shorter detection distance than the roar and rumble vocalizations. Uh, different from Leuser, the distance detection in Waikambas National Park placed the center point in the elephant grazing point because elephants were not always kept in cages. One recorder placed near the elephant and another recorder is placed at fixed point. 100 meter until one kilometer. In one of the identified data session, the result in the forest area showed that the trumpet and the squeak sounds were no longer detected at this distance. And in non-forest area, a roar and long roar can be heard until 282 millimeter meter from the elephant. The difference in the farthest distance is possible because of the difference in land cover between forest and non-forest. Uh, and the last, this is the challenges. Here are some of our challenges that we got in the field. The first one, uh, wild elephant. There are wild elephants group that often go to the camp, camp area, so made us stop the observation for some days because it is quite dangerous for us and for the devices. So we have more aware for the installation placement of the devices and make sure is it, it is safe. Uh, we also get bad weather, so we cannot go to the field. Even if we install the device, it, may, it will make a lot of noises that we get because of the rain and the wind. The next one is device error, such as recorder posted by itself, and it happened a few times. Sometimes we also need to update software, even though we were in the bad internet signal location. So we have to find a good signal location at the time. And the last, our recorder was broken by elephant and other animals as shown in the picture. That's why the safe installation and placement of the devices is important. And this is our reference that we used. So that's all my explanation about our research and our journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giot. That was really interesting to see, to listen to all the different elephant sounds because we usually think of elephants as having trumpets only, but they do actually make a lot of diverse sounds uh, in their vocal behavior. So, um, so that was all of the speakers that we will hear from today. We'll talk about their research. Um, we, have, we have been getting lots of questions from the chat and also from Facebook Live. So I would like to now uh, take this uh, opportunity to thank all of, our, all of our speakers for sharing their research with us today. And I would like to invite them <clears throat> to the virtual stage <laughs> to uh, have a little question and answer uh, and discussion with the audience. So Giat and Dina and Ethan and Hustin and Mei, 
Uh, please, uh, you are able to unmute your microphone and let's get through some questions. All right. Are we all ready? <laughs> okay. So the first question is for Dina uh, from John Tassirin. What are the variables in a sonogram to differentiate one species to another? Yeah, great. That's, uh, that's a good question. And it really, it depends on the species of interest um, and also what you are hoping to do with that information. Um, Generally, you need to have some sort of natural history or understanding of the behavior of the animals and what the calls sound like. Um, and then once you can do that, then you can create spectrograms. And if you're interested in testing for differences between two species, you can do what is called feature extraction from the spectrogram where we would use Raven or something else. Um, and you kind of draw boxes around the notes and you estimate the note duration, frequency, et cetera. Um, there are other kind of automated ways that we can do what is called feature extraction as well. Um, that it really, it depends mostly on kind of the, the research question, what you're hoping to do with that information. and also specifics of the, the animals. So, you know, if they're two really closely related species that humans have a really hard time telling apart, you might not be able to use the computers to tell them apart either. Uh, the other time that it will be quite challenging is if they are calling right at the same time on top of each other. And in those cases, a lot of times we won't be able to tell um, two species or two individuals apart if they're at the same frequency range too, so. Yeah, I can understand also um, measuring sound is very objective as well, right? And it's quite difficult to, for different researchers to measure the same sound and still get the same results. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a really great point. Um, I was very surprised when I got into bioacoustics because you know, you're studying, basically it's a sound wave and, you know, it's like, it's all numbers and it should be really, really, as you said, objective. But when we do a lot of this, what we call feature extraction, like you have to make decisions about what features you're going to extract. Um, and there's a lot of subjectivity and trying to make right. your best educated guess. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's uh, it, it was surprising and we're, we're moving with the more automated feature extraction methods, like the, there are less decisions well, there are different decisions that have to be made, but you still have to say, okay, so if it's automated feature extraction method, like how many features are we going to estimate? What method are we going to use? So yeah, there's just lots of decisions um, that you have to kind of make just based on your best, your best guess in yeah. the literature, et cetera. So. Yeah, that's what I meant, subjective actually. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that, yeah. That brings us to uh, our next question. Uh, from Muhammad Iqbal about the sign uh, from the sound library talk. Um, if we have bird sound recordings, is there any R package that can extract the most similar sound from a source like Zeno Canto? I think I believe this is for me. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, but <laughs> uh, I'm actually not that sure. But if yeah, is there any other? um speakers that would like to answer this question because i'm just uh getting into this uh, sound library and bioacoustics so yeah i haven't come across to any uh, r packages that uh, can extract sounds from uh, resources um so there there is an r package that can access zeno kanto and i believe it's a uh, warbler warbler r, um, yeah. The the next step of <laughs> if you kind of say, OK, I have this recording and I want to match it to something to, in Zeno Canto, I'm, I haven't used that package. I, I'm not sure if that functionality exists in that capacity kind of right out of the box, but it is something that you could feasibly train a detector in R if you know what species you have or you're looking for. So. Yeah. Thank you. I have used Wobbler R before, and yeah, you can extract from Zeno Canto. Um, but that there's also some functions where you can, um, like you said, detect the sounds from 
what you uh, downloaded from Zeno Canto, but I wouldn't know how to use that to match with your current sound. So maybe there's uh, some more discussion from there that we can have later on. Can I okay. use this just to, this time just to give a little plug for um, our BirdNet app? And yes. I think I have the, the link here. So this is not uh, an R thing, but it's open to everybody who, who wants to download it. And so it's an app on your phone that you can go and you can record birds and it can ID them for you. And all of the, the models underneath uh, the code is actually freely available. So if you're really proficient um, in coding, and I believe it's a Python, um, that you can use those models and adapt them for yourself. And so the bird net should work in Malaysia um, <laughs> and hopefully we'll be testing it and training it a lot more. Um, so anyways, that's another really great thing that's coming out of our lab, so. Awesome, awesome. Okay, um, there is a next question and it's from Thuraso uh, during the Herb Talk. How do you identify the species when two or more species are making songs simultaneously? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so when we use uh, software, we use Raven, we can listen while looking at the spectrogram. Um, each species have different uh, spectrogram shape. So maybe the spectrogram seems to overlap, but since this, if each species has a different spectrogram, uh, so they can be distinguished. That's it. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's another question from Albert Chan, who asked from the Facebook Live um, for the Gibbons talk. Do you have an estimate of the population of Gibbons? If critical, do we need to start captive breeding? I believe this is for Ethan. Right, I have replied to that uh, earlier. I will say it here, over here anyway. Uh, no, I don't have the whole, uh, I mean, the, the estimate for the entirety of, well, at least Peninsula Malaysia, but I do have an estimate for Ulumuda, but I cannot say it here because it's, uh, my, manuscript, my manuscript has not been accepted yet. Uh, once once uh, that has turned out to be accepted, then yes, I will announce it in the public. Um, can we do captive breeding? I think the focus here should be, um, well, um, restoring the degraded forest, improving the connectivity between forest fragment, and also you know, halting the, the deforestation. Because I don't think um, captive breeding will be a success for gibbons because, well, they really need a, a good forest to, to thrive. And their home range is huge. Yeah, they, they occupy a home range of 22 hectares. And we cannot offer that for once for multiple uh, small apes families. So I think it will be unrealistic to breed them, breed them in captivity in, in, a, in an attempt to save them. So I think the focus should be on you know, protecting their habitat. Very good point. Very good point indeed. Um, and I think protecting their habitat is way cheaper than having a captive program anyway. So um, there is a, a follow-up question for Gibbons talk as well. Do all the 20 species of small apes sing or only the genus of Siamang and Gibbons from Rongler, also from Facebook? Right, so this is, uh, well, um, there are four gen genera in the family of small apes. So the Siamang is the only member of its genus. And then you have uh, Hylobates, and you have Nomascus, and also the Hoodlock. So there are only four genera, and they are all gibbons or small apes. So this, this should answer part of your questions. And yes, they do, they all of them do sing, but uh, my supervisor, uh, Susan, uh, thanks for your tip late uh, just now, that. Um, she points out that there are two species, the Javan gibbons and the Claus gibbons, both of them in the, the genus Hylobates uh, in parts of uh, Indonesia. They do not sing duets. Okay, in those species, the male and female sing separate songs. Very good 
Very cool. Thank you so much. And I think we uh, don't really realize that a lot of gibbons and mammals uh, in Malaysia actually have song and calls and they use that to communicate with each other. And it's uh, it makes sense because we are, uh, our forest is very dense and um, it's actually uh, very hard to communicate with each other. So um, having uh, long distance calls would, would make sense. Um, next question is for Giot uh, from uh, GD Oka. She says, uh, great research, Giot. I want to ask about the broken devices. Do you know what animal usually break the devices and any tips for installation, the device, installing the device so it's not easily broken down by any animal? Uh, okay, thank you, Oka, for the question. Uh, for the one device, we are not really sure about what the exactly animal that broke the device, but the other recorders was broken by elephant. And the more great hard case will be more safe for the devices. And don't forget to tighten the rope or chain. And for the installation, must over four meters from the ground and in the big tree, because the big tree, uh, the big mammals can break the tree. Yes, <laughs> maybe that's but the how, suggestion. How do you climb up to the tree to tie the device? <laughs> uh, you have to climb uh, with it? Uh, yeah, ask help. The, for the uh, with the mahout. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Yes. <laughs> I'm imagining in my in my head actually asking the mahout to sit on the elephant and then the elephant will like lift you up, tie the device or something. <laughs> that would be a cool scene to see. <laughs> okay, um, there is another question. Um, any tips and tricks to find a better device placement? Um, and Abi Mayu seems to want to hear some tiger sounds. Any advice for that? And I think this question is open to anyone who wants to answer as well. Okay, maybe yeah. uh, I will try to uh, ask the question. We are not really sure about it now because we are we are still do the experiment for our research and. And we have not got the final result, so we don't have any question, any suggestion that the final result like that for the tiger. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would, uh, would like to answer that question? Okay, um, we have another question. Um, I'm sorry if it's not in order. Um, so Ida has asked, some birds sometimes can mimic other birds' voice. Can we analyze the difference between them? Which is the genuine one? I would like to know the answer to this as well, actually. <laughs> Maybe Mayi would like to uh, have a go at this. Um, thank you for the question. So I believe that this, uh, even though they make the sound, I mean the like the pattern of the other the sound and other of other birds, but then there will still be a difference in frequency, uh, yeah, frequency and also like amplitude, like the volume, and also the frequency of the birds so like these birds they only have this range of frequency so I think we can differentiate them according to that it's like although the pattern and the sound is happening at the same time yeah okay um next question would be what's the most effective effective approach to analyze the data. As mentioned before, there are several approaches such as human listening and fully automated machine learning, et cetera. Uh, maybe Dina can have a go at this question. Yeah, seems like that was a target to me. And um, maybe this is the, uh, not a very satisfying answer, but it, it really depends <laughs> what your research question is. 
Um, and so I can speak from experience with my work. So a lot of my early work was on uh, Gibbon vocalizations and I was interested in looking at individual differences. And so in that case, it's really fine scale differences and it required me to do a lot of the annotation and I drew just like, I think I calculated, I don't know how many notes, but it was like hours and hours of doing these annotations because that was the research question and I needed to basically get that information. And we do have uh, something in Raven, it's called the band limited energy detector, which helped me draw the boxes around the notes, um, but then I had to go in and kind of fix those. And so that was because that was a very specific question that I needed to know the individual differences and it's hard to get the automated methods to basically draw the boxes around the notes as effectively as a human can do. Um, but that, you know, that's, that's changing now. Um, but so like the BirdNet uh, app and the model that I mentioned, so that is a pretty much fully automated uh, deep learning model and it works really, really well for identifying different species of birds. And so, but those are two really different questions, looking at individual differences in gibbon vocalizations versus looking at the soundscape of temperate Northern birds. And so again, it's just, it really, it, it depends. So um, I would say probably whatever you're planning to do, expect to have a lot of expert human <laughs> time and effort into analyzing the data. Um, and even with the approaches that we can use kind of out of the box in terms of machine learning, automated detection, all of that, you need trained observers who can label the data for you. And then you need somebody at the other end once it goes through and does the detections to basically say, yes, this is what it's saying it is or what it's not. Um, so I think whatever you're planning to do, expect the analysis to require a lot of human um, effort at this point, so. Yeah, yeah, we are still at the stage to at developing this. So uh, for now, we still need a lot of human input. Yeah, like you said. Um, we have lots of questions, but we are running short on time. So I'm just gonna do one more last question, which is, uh, it's so hard to choose. Okay, I'll choose the one that is more like conservation based, okay? So one, um, Panji Gusti Akbar was saying, uh, one concern about the song library is that the fact uh, that Poacher is using it for catching songbirds. Zeno Kanto deal with it by limiting one spe uh, some species song so that it is not downloadable to the public. But there's a debate how it actually makes some research more difficult to get uh, recording reference to those species um, that actually need the research most. Um, so does any speaker have uh, opinions regarding this? Um, I guess uh, anyone can answer this because it's, this is re regarding um, um, where you get sounds from and um, how restrictive they should be. Um, maybe someone can start it off. Let's see. Maybe Hastin, you would like to give it a go? Or may you? <laughs> Up to you, if you feel comfortable. I guess the question is saying um, there, there are really uh, some species that are endangered that are um, people who want to poach them and it's it's actually illegal to to get uh, to get their sounds uh, I mean to get their location and their sounds as well um, and sometimes poachers use the sounds to play back to the um, in the wild to attract these species uh, to their cages so um, do you have anything to add to that yeah I guess it's a very tricky topic as well. And we um, don't have a silver bullet to that yet. Um, and it's such a, yes, 
uh, it's an important question that needs to be uh, thought through by our researchers and how to uh, make research accessible. I know that eBird has uh, a special request where if you are a researcher, you can uh, send in a, a special request for um, endangered species that is not displayed on eBird. Um, and you can download the data and you can you need to tell them about uh, what your research is doing. Um, yeah, so if there's no uh, further comments, we can move on to the next agenda in our program. Um, if everyone's happy with that. Okay. So this is the moment that we've been waiting for. Um, the announcement of the launch of the Cornell uh, Bioacoustics Mentoring Program for Indonesians and Malaysian researchers. And we will have uh, Dr. Wendy Erb to uh, officially launch this uh, program. It is very generous and exciting, and I would certainly want to apply myself as well. Um, so, okay. So now uh, let's introduce Wendy. So Wendy is a primate ecologist focused on better understanding the impacts of environmental change and human activities on wild uh, primate populations and especially on Bornean orangutans in Indonesia. Over to you, Wendy. Yay, we're at the end. Okay, uh, let me see, I'll get my screen shared here. Hopefully everyone can see it. Yeah. Okay. Terima kasih banyak. Selamat pagi pada semuanya. Uh, maaf sebentar. Okay. Semoga sudah bisa lihat semuanya. So thank you everybody. We made it to the end of um, this morning, this evening's program. Uh, we had such an inspirational and amazing uh, lineup of speakers tonight. I'm just completely blown away and so grateful um, to share this space with all of you. Um, so we really are excited to announce that uh, we are launching a brand new program tonight, officially with all of you here tonight on Zoom and on Facebook um, for a new award a bioacoustics equipment and mentorship award so you can scan that qr code uh, with your personal devices um, and this is our indonesia malaysia program that is um, co-sponsored and co-organized by university science malaysia universitas gajah mada and our team here at the center for concert kaylee C. yang center for conservation and bioacoustics at the cornell lab of ornithology uh, so what's this program all about? Um, we are looking to support researchers to establish conservation oriented acoustic monitoring projects in Indonesia or Malaysia. Um, and the award comprises training, mentoring, as well as equipment. Uh, so let's get into some of the nitty gritty details. Who can apply? We are accepting proposals from individuals or teams of students, of researchers, of conservation practitioners. Um, we're really targeting uh, permanent residents or citizens of Indonesia or Malaysia. So if you are a team, we are asking that at least half of your team, if not more, um, is from those populations. Um, and because our trainings are going to be conducted in English primarily, we would request that at least one team member is proficient in English um, so that you can take the most out of those trainings uh, for your team. So in terms of the proposal selection, we have an amazing team from the K. Lisa Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics, University of Gajamada, and University Science Malaysia. So scientists who um, have the expertise and knowledge to be able to evaluate your proposals um, on the following criteria. So we'll be looking at the rationale. So like sort of the background and the importance of these projects how feasible the results of your work will be within a, a one year time frame. Uh, we'll take into consideration like how scalable is your project? 
Um, could we take your project idea and bring it to other places in Southeast Asia or apply it to um, future conservation challenges? And of course, we want you to focus in on species or habitat conservation. Uh, we're hoping to be able to fund somewhere between five and seven teams. Each team will get four Swift, uh, Swift ones. So these are autonomous recorders that you'll be able to uh, place out in the field to set up your own passive acoustic monitoring projects. Uh, we will provide all of the sort of accessory materials that you need, SD cards and batteries, external hard drives to store the data on. Uh, there will be training from um, the researchers and staff here at the Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics and monthly meetings for mentorship. So um, to be very clear, we are not looking for people who are experts in bioacoustics, who know everything already to apply for these um, awards. We are looking for people who have good ideas, who have enthusiasm, who have passion, um, and our job is going to be to make sure that you have the tools and the knowledge and the resources that you need to succeed. So what we're expecting for the folks who are selected by our selection committee is that you will conduct a year of bioacoustics research. Um, I think I have the dates wrong there, so I'm pretty sure we're going to start in June. Uh, so it'll be June to May. Uh, we will ask all the teams to participate in two virtual trainings and to attend monthly Zoom meetings with your mentors as well as um, the other teams that are selected. Um, and then at the end of the program, we're going to be really excited to um, have a format, a symposium for the recipients to be able to share the findings of your one year of data collection and analysis. Um, and we're really hoping that we can do this all together in person in Malaysia or Indonesia. Um, time will tell. Okay, so this is what you really need to know. How do you apply? Uh, I popped up this QR code on all the slides. So again, scan that. You can go to that website there. We have an application form online. It's a pretty simple, we hope simple enough um, proposal process. So there's a cover page that um, where you can sort of input the title and where you're doing your research and who your team is and a really, really quick description of what you're doing. Um, a narrative and bibliography for your proposal, as well as short CVs for all of your team members. Um, all of this, again, is available on our website. So if you miss something right now, um, all of these details are there. So you'll just submit your application by email to bioacoustics at cornell.edu. Really key point of information here is that you want to make sure you get your proposals in by the 1st of April 2022 um, in uh, by before midnight in Eastern Indonesian time. So Waktu Indonesia Timor and the start date will be in early June of this year. We want to make sure that all of you understand that uh, we're really committed to diversity and inclusion at the K. Lisa Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics. So we're really thinking um, critically and deeply about um, how we can uh, compensate for the fact that the tools and knowledge needed for effective acoustic monitoring need to be accessible and inclusive for the people that live in the places uh, where we're conducting this research. Um, and we understand and acknowledge that researchers and conservationists have been marginalized or excluded from these activities historically. So we're really strongly um, encouraging applicants from historically underrepresented uh, groups to apply to these awards. Uh, we want to also take this opportunity to formally announce that we have um, training videos for our Raven software. Uh, so this is the primary acoustic analysis software that you've seen in many of the presentations tonight. Uh, so we have a YouTube channel with training videos and we have those all available in Bahasa Indonesia now. Uh, so hopefully for teman-teman di Malaysia juga bisa mengerti dan belajar bagaimana bisa menggunakan software Raven 
Uh, so we're really excited to be able to um, provide these capacity building and training opportunities uh, for our friends and colleagues in um, Malaysia and Indonesia in a more accessible format. So with that, we are really looking forward to reading your proposal. Please reach out if you have any questions uh, about how to write your proposal or how to put together a team. Uh, like we said, we're really not looking for experts in bioacoustics. We're trying to get groups of people who are passionate about conservation, really looking forward to um, doing something that's going to really move the needle on primate or I'm sorry, <laughs> I have the primate uh, bias on uh, any kind of animal or habitat conservation uh, activity that you would like to do in Indonesia or Malaysia. Uh, really excited to be working with this amazing uh, team of scientists and conservationists in the United States, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And we're really excited to accept and review your proposals and get in touch if you have any questions whatsoever. And I'm happy to take any questions that we have time to field now. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Wendy. That's very, very exciting to have this award in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so excited to apply as well. So if anyone in the audience, you need a team, contact me <laughs> and anyone else, of course, in the, in the, in the speakers list, <laughs> not just me. Um, so now we have uh, some time for questions for Dr. Wendy. Um, is there any questions from the chat? Or if you'd like to unmute yourself to ask, that's okay as well. Okay, there is a question from Ashraf. Is there a go-to email for us to ask questions regarding this new program and the writing uh, proposal writing? Yes, I think my colleague Dina dropped that in the chat there. So it's bioacoustics at coronel.edu. And as she correctly notes there, you can also email either Dina or myself uh, directly. So you can Google the Kaylee C. Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics. We have a whole website there. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dina. There's also, there's also another question from Muhammad Iqbal. Apa nama channel YouTube? Yeah, what is the ch YouTube channel name? Yeah, nama channel YouTube-nya adalah uh, Bioacoustics at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Sebentar saya cari link-nya. Nice, thank you. <laughs> I put in the chat already. Oh, thank you, Dina. <laughs> oh, yeah, Sudada. YouTube.com slash, it's a very long name, but it's up there. <laughs> thank you. Awesome, awesome. I was also really impressed how you are like very fluent in Indonesian as well. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> how many years have you been working in Indonesia? Oh, since 2005. So, wow. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look as vibrant and young as ever. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's another question. Um, to your experience, will the device subject to be subjected to uh, import tax? If yes, would it be covered as well from for Indonesia? Ooh, yeah, such a good question. So we're still working on it, but our plan is to get everything into the country so that the recipients will only um, have to coordinate with our in-country partners. So for Indonesian teams, we'll be coordinating through Universitas Gajamada, and for our Malaysian teams, we'll be coordinating through University Science Malaysia. Um, so it should just be a domestic shipping, uh, mm -hmm. relatively minor logistic challenge there. So the recipients of the equipment shouldn't have to worry at all about international shipping. Thank you. Um, I guess another follow up question would be how long would it take to do you think uh, the estimated time to arrive into Indonesia or Malaysia for the equipment to arrive? Such a good question. We're still working on it. Our hope is that everything is in Indonesia and in Malaysia, the countries, uh, before the grants are awarded, announced and awarded. So that mm -hmm. is what we are working towards. Again, we're not expecting 
that the grant recipients are going to have to worry about any of that. So that is our sincere hope. And that's what we've been working on for a couple of months. Thank Not you so much for doing control, this. But we're doing the best that we can. <laughs> yes, true, true. I understand <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and during this time when COVID is happening, it's it's really, really, really good that you guys are doing this for us because, um, yeah, we cannot travel and we cannot meet in person yet. So this is a very good opportunity. Oh, uh, there's another question: Is the country in is the con is the country partner in Indonesia, uh, Pak Imran? Yeah, so Pak Imran is our partner in Indonesia at Universitas Gadjah Mada, and Nadine Rupert is our primary collaborator at University Science Malaysia. They've been extraordinary. We're so delighted and honored to be partnering with them. Nice. Awesome. Um, any other questions or comments? Let me check my Facebook Live as well. Ah, oh, can uh, da, 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 da. what if the Swift recorder got stolen mid project? What happens? <laughs> well, I think in our training we will cover some ways that you might try to prevent theft of your recording units. If things get stolen, uh, you know, this is not anything anybody can control. So let's not worry about grant recipients being concerned about liability or anything like that. Um, we will certainly be understanding of things happen in the field. We've all mm -hmm. done field research for, for years yeah. and understand that these things can't be completely controlled. So please don't yeah. let that kind of thing concern you about applying. We will make sure that we do our best to address those things. Great awesome. question. <laughs> <laughs> Very important question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I think that's all of the questions we have. And thank you everyone for joining us today and the, the speakers for sharing your experience and research and all of the audience who has uh, stayed with us until the end. Um, at the maximum point, we have over 140 participants, including Facebook Live today. So that's a really good turnout. Um, so yeah, uh, with that, we have come to a close to today's event. Um, Bioacoustics in Indonesia and Malaysia, Conservation in Action. So thank you very much. Um, and I hope to enjoy this webinar and bye for now. <laughs> thank you to our amazing moderator. Thank, Thank you, you for everybody. <laughs> Let's take a good photo. Oh, yes, yes. I forgot about that. <laughs> um, oh, you can also click some reactions and turn on your video. Like, say, ta-da! Reactions everywhere. <laughs> okay, you have to pose for a few seconds for Ethan to screenshot. <laughs> All right, give me a moment. Hang on. Okay, just one page. Hi, Bang Burita. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. If you like to be <laughs> welcome, thank you. Okay. Is that all good? Yep, all good. Thank, thank you, you very Rita. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Good rest. Good day.